amazing men, if you could, uh, during the evening. Uh, we have a couple of guest speakers who are going to get up first. Um, we're going to introduce you and read their bios to you. Uh, Matt Ganim, recovering addict, father of two, poet, recovery advocate, and CEO of Aftermath Addiction Treatment Center. With him will be Greg Moulton, recovering addict, husband, father, and director of community outreach at Mayflower Recovery Center. Let's hear from them, please. Greg is going to go first. Let's hear from Greg, everybody. Yeah, I'm just wicked nervous. Pretend sorry. Right? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Greg Moulton. I'm a person in long term recovery. Um, I actually beat Matt up here because Matt is an awesome speaker. If you haven't heard him, he has some awesome poetry, so I don't want to go after him. You know? Uh, supposed to make people laugh there, but I, I guess it did uh, I'm hanging on by a thread here, and I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's an honor to be here. Like I said, I'm a person with long-term recovery. Uh, my sobriety date is November 27, 2014. I haven't found it necessary to use a drug uh, or alcohol since then. Um, you know, and seeing all the people here, it's a lot of people that I haven't seen since I was about 10 years old. And like seeing them going down memory lane, uh, I grew up about a mile and a half from here in the Clarence Hill Towers in Teal Square. And uh, I have my family here, you know, they're always here to support me. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool. And uh, I'm sitting up here and talking about the, the disease of addiction and, and my recovery and like kind of my journey and how I got here. Um, you know, I, I grew up running around Trump Field, going to, you know, going to Peony's Pizza, it was not here anymore, and, uh, you know, I actually, I think it moved, you know, before, I've actually been to the, you know, Dark Boys Tavern before, it was on Hill Tavern, and it's just, it's, it's, it's really cool that all this stuff has changed, and, you know, that this is here, and that, you know, to thank you and give a shout out to, you know, putting it on Broadway, for putting on some time. Teresa, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's cool to have these things, have this restaurant here, and, and be able to put on like an event for awareness for addiction. Because you know, I know everyone in this room can probably raise their hand and you know know that they've lost someone or someone close to them, or know someone that has lost someone from the disease of addiction. You know, just like all the names that are on the TV, um, this city included has lost you know numerous people. Uh, I've lost numerous friends and family members. Uh, I, you know, two twin two twin cousins that I've lost. You know, that are no longer here with us. That I, you know, that I miss every single day. Kyle and Craig Vivian. We both, you know, we lost to addiction about a mile from here. And uh, you know, those are like my my we were like the three amigos, my two best friends. And you know, I don't have them today. And like I try to do be a living amends and, and live for them and, and uh, you know, maintain my recovery. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's uh, it's crazy that, you know, I, help, I work for Mayflower Recovery, like they said before, and, uh, you know, my job is to pretty much spread awareness and, and also to give, you know, educate people on the disease of addiction, because a lot of people might not know that there's resources there, that there's people there. Um, you know, to help them. You know, there might be someone in this room that's that's here or has a, someone who's struggling and they don't know how to, where to turn or where to go or who to call. And, you know, and I'm just trying to be that, um, you know, that beacon of hope or just to be that resource for someone to, to utilize when, you know, when in a time of need. Um, that's pretty much what I'm here for is, is to be a resource for someone if, if they have someone that they want to talk to or, or anything, if there's a, you know, uh, a struggling mother out there who has a son or, or a daughter and they don't know who to turn to, like, I I'm here for you. That, that's, I, I feel like that that's my purpose in life, and my purpose in life is to help people. And I realized that through my recovery is that, like, the, the purpose of life is to help one another. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy that 
people don't understand that it's only like the addict themselves that is struggling, but it's actually their families too. You know, and there's, there's meetings and there's places for people to get help with their addiction, but there's also there's also meetings and places that the family members can go to as well. Um, and I can help with resources for that as well. And uh, you know, like there's, there's Al-Anon, Narna meetings, there is like Family Restore, there's like other, there's other services that the families can also go to, to, um, you know, get the help or get the education that they, that they need. Um, you know, and it's easier for me to kind of speak or, or be comfortable or, or talk to other addicts, but when it's, when it's like other, other people that don't suffer from the, from the disease of addiction and how to talk to them it, it, it's very hard to do and uh, you know and I just try to try to give people hope in a sense and uh, you know at a, at a young age you know I, I hung around the kids like at, in the projects and, and you know like with my friend playing basketball and I see the older kids just like hanging out and and having the girls and the la- and the cars and the loud music and, and like that was my environment that I was surrounded by. So when I got a little bit older, I thought that that's what I had to do, and I was like a product of my environment. And uh, you know, quickly, uh, I, I believe that I was like born with the disease of addiction, and uh, you know, and and at that age, around like 15, I moved to Arlington and I, and I met some people like all oh, the friends in there, and I felt like an outcast and. I had gotten moved away from all the friends that I had here and you know I was like angry at my mom and like this and that and I didn't understand like and like the fa- the kids that I was hanging out with like had like really nice things and their families worked hard for them they had nice houses and like, like all this stuff and like you know I didn't come from that so I had to I felt like I had to get outside of myself and forget that like you know that I had like actually a really nice life and uh, you know so I used and my, my addiction like very quickly just uh, like took over everything that I wanted. I didn't care about anything after that. Like all I cared about was like the next one. And then from about four to five years, like my life was a complete blur. From about 2010 to 2014, I don't really remember much. Um, you know, I ended up, you know, homeless, running around the streets of Boston, in and out of jails for at least a weekend, in and out of treatment centers, in and out of detoxes, and, and I didn't know where to turn. I had, pretty much burned every bridge you know my mother's my my family didn't trust me anymore they called the cops whenever i was around it was actually um you know it got so bad that i ended up like sectioning myself uh, section 35 in the state of massachusetts you know here is like a civil suit where you can lock yourself up pretty much for 30 days and like that's what i had to do because i physically couldn't stop using it on my own I couldn't go into like a treatment center or like voluntarily or detox or anything like that and actually, you know, and try to help myself. I had to like almost lock myself up and know that I wasn't there, that I was going to be there for 30 days. And, uh, and like, that's what I did. And, um, you know, like through my, through my years of like using, I was so numb to, you know, to everything and just blind to all the loss or all the pain that I was going through that I just continue to use, but for some reason, when I was in that in that program, uh, there was some, another guy in there who had been there for like a little bit before me, and um, I didn't know him from a hole in the wall. He, I was probably there with him for like a week, and like he had completed the program, and he left, and within 24 hours, we had found out that he was no longer with us. And like, I was like, that, for some reason, that scared me. I didn't know him at all. Um, and like I was like, holy crap, like that's gonna be me. I'm gonna leave here and I'm gonna use and I'm gonna end up, you know, I'm gonna end up dying. And uh, I realized that from my addiction is that that's what was gonna happen to me. <laughs> and um, you know, like when I got in there, I got with my case manager and I talked to my mom and I talked to a sober house owner and like I eventually got to that sober house and uh, you know, actually the Dan there's a guy here who's actually the house manager of the house when I walked in there. Uh, I didn't know anyone or anything about recovery or anything about meetings and like he was there and like I got to that sober house and my mom said like good luck and and like that was it that's how I started my journey like age seven and a half years ago and uh, you know before when I was in programs I'd be around guys that you know great guys but they weren't I mean they were kind of in the same mentality as I was like before when I was younger I was saying about the environment that I was around I was always a product of my environment whatever I was around that's what I was doing you know, and when I got to this house, 
Um, you know, like there were some guys in there that had like six months sober, a year sober, that were like getting their life back together, that were starting to see their kids, that were, you know, staying out of trouble, that were going to work every day, that were going to meetings, that were going to these things called meetings, and I had no idea, or they were going to like narcotics anonymous meetings and alcoholics anonymous meetings, and like going to therapy and like getting help and trying to better their lives, and and I was like, holy, like, holy crap, I need to do this. And, um, you know, I was a 23, 24 year old kid, didn't really have much responsibilities, didn't have anything going on. And, and I went with them and I just stuck around like the winners. And eventually I was like with the guys that were like doing the right thing, going to meetings and like having a sponsor and like doing these step work. And like, that's what works for me. It's not a pathway for everybody. Um, but that's what helped me is like going to meetings, and, like doing these 12 steps and, and like going to therapy. And, and um, like that's what's worked for me and that's what like so far like that's that's what i do and um you know whatever it is for anyone that's in here that's in recovery and whatever helps them or works for them like i fully support this very there's there's many pathways of recovery uh, and um you know like that was that was 2015 i remember i got in six months a little story like, you know uh, a friend of mine sophia i'll never forget when i had like she knew i was coming up on six months sober and, and like you need that much time to kind of speak in a meeting um and she was like hey greg like how much time do you have i was like oh i got six months to you know tomorrow and uh she was like great you're speaking for me tuesday night and i'm streaming all day and like you're you're the speaker and i like i like shook for a second you know i was like oh you know i like i, I said yes but like i shook my head no um and like i don't really i don't i spoke at the meeting and i don't really remember much of what I said, I mumbled some stuff and like cried and like everyone got up and like and, and, and clapped and, and, and clapped for me. And I felt like a thousand pounds had gotten lifted off of my shoulders. Um, and I wish I could say it got easier after that, but it doesn't. You know, I'm I'm, I'm nervous now. Like I try to, I'm, I'm I think too much and I want to try and help as many people as I can. And um, I, I just have to know that just by being me and doing the next right thing that I can hopefully help someone, save someone's life just for today, like today. And um, like that's what I do. And like guys came up to me after and they were like, hey Greg, like, thanks for sharing. Like I'm just going through the same things. Like I'm in this house over here. And like, thank you, like you helped me tonight. And uh, like, that was awesome. And um, I remember I got like a year, a year sober and I helped, oh, I shared and celebrated at my home group and like my family was there. and. You know, and like there was a lot of, you know, a lot of people that helped me or that I hurt in, during my addiction that was there for me in my, my one year of recovery. And uh, I was just like flashbacking to people like my friends from high school or college or, you know, people that I grew up with that were traveling the world and getting married or graduating college and uh, buying houses and doing all these really cool things. And, and like I had a year sober and that meant everything. And like you couldn't take that from me and like that that's all I ever want. You know, and, and and I know that by keeping my recovery first, you know, I can do anything in this world. Uh, you know, with, with my foundation. Like you don't build a house from with the with the roof or the windows, if you start with like, the foundation with the concrete with the with the with the bottom and you work your way up. Um, and like for me my recovery is my foundation. That's that's my you know, that's my concrete uh, and everything else just falls into place. Um, and as far as, you know, uh, you know, Mayflower Recovery is a, is a detox residential facility located in Wilmington, Mass. Um, you know, we're a 48 bed facility, you know, that I get the honor of like helping people there and I get to help be in the community and, and give hope to other addicts and alcoholics that are struggling and work with their families. And I'm a certified family interventionist, so I'm always on the phone, like helping helping mothers and helping fathers and like helping loved ones and, and you know and addicts and alcoholics get into get into treatment or whatever the case is 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 what they're looking for or what kind of help it is that they want whatever whatever the way is that i can help someone with their whatever it is that they're going through or help spread awareness whether that's on the phone or coming to an event or or going to a hospital or going to a community event or, or going to, going to wherever uh, whatever I can do to, to give people hope that or some experience, you know, that this is possible, that you can, you know, cope with your addiction and find recovery and that there's a solution and, you know, I'm living proof and that there is a way out. Um, you know, we've lost like a lot of people like, in the city here and uh, recently too. And, you know, it's, it, it's got everywhere, you know, everywhere. Uh, and I know it's not easy, but please, 
please, you know, if you're struggling, if you know anyone that's struggling, please come up to me or, you know, contact me. There is some, you know, some free uh, information about about Mayflower, about me. My, my contact is there, so please feel free to grab anything over there. Or if you have any questions, find me after the event. Thanks, I'm Greg, I'm an addict. How was that? Was that awesome or what? And he was nervous. He didn't seem nervous at all, did he? I would like to welcome Matt Gannon. If you would come up, Matt, please. I don't know. We'll see. How's everybody doing out there? My name is Matt. I'm a grateful recovering heroin addict. I just celebrated 16 years. I like a little energy. Can we give a round of applause for Greg too? It's not easy getting up here and sharing. And for everybody else that's coming up after. Um, you know, it's pretty cool being up here. Um, you know, walking in the doors, not even walking in the doors. I was in the parking lot with, with uh, you know, with Chris, and it just brought back like a ton of memories. Like I'm an old man right now, at least that's how I feel. But the DeRocha family has always treated me like I was a part of theirs. Like even since I was young and strung out, where a lot of people wouldn't, where a lot of people wouldn't even have, have given me a second look, right? I was 16 years old and homeless. I was couch hopping, bouncing from place to place, strung out at a young age. I went through four high schools in two different states. And like along the journey, you burn bridges. And um, one of the, like, the coolest things is like Roger, Shane, Big Raj. Like the whole DeRosha family has always looked out for me and always like celebrated my recovery too, like when I was able to turn my life around. And like what they do for the community and for the youth, uh, like when I was engaged in sports as a kid, I did well, right? I was, I was a good athlete, half decent athlete at baseball and basketball. And when I was engaged with good coaches that, that really supported me, like I, I stayed out of trouble, I was constantly playing, I had that support that I needed. And when I got away from that, it was easy to see how like the temptation of like the drugs and the lifestyle caught up with me and I separated from sports. So it's like huge that an event like this and, and, and a lot of the, the portion, if not all of them, from my knowledge, is going to Somerville Youth Pop Warner. So uh, anybody out there, right, gotta open up their wallets and donate. I'm looking at a table of a bunch of treatment centers too that could open up because I will, I'll match any dollar that they put up. I'm looking at you, Danny. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I came up, um, I struggled with Oxycontin, right? A couple drugs before that, ecstasy my freshman year when I got kicked out of two schools. But OCs was really like what hit me. And when I was coming up, we had no idea what Oxycontin was. We had no idea that the first time that I tried it, that my destiny was going to be a homeless IV heroin addict, right? That I was going to burn every bridge around me until I was left on an island. And, uh, you know... When you go through those type of struggles and you, you deal with that desperation, you burn your family and you burn your friends, like, it's not the easiest thing to turn your life around. And, like, when I come in here, I see a bunch of people in recovery that, that like, are such shining examples of hope, you know? Especially because I know, like, what the despair and that depth of hopelessness feels like. And, like, events like this are trying to put up awareness and trying to show that, like, we can talk about it. Because I remember when I was getting high, my father couldn't go to somebody and say, hey, my son's a heroin addict. Because he would be looked at with shame and stigma, like, what did you do wrong? Right? Well, that wasn't what my parents did. My parents never looked at me like, hey, I want to raise a heroin addict as a kid. You know? And uh, fortunately, I hit rock bottom. I was completely broken, homeless. Uh, and I ended up in a halfway house, the Hamilton House in Dorchester, uh, at a very young age. Um, I was fortunate that I got clean when I was 21 years old. And uh, in that halfway house, I was there with 26 guys that were either on their way to prison or they were paroled to that program. So at 21 years old, when I was weighing like 145 pounds, still looking like I was strung out, all like the tough guy, street kid, drug dealer, stick up kid, all the things that I did that I used to live with, like the illusion of who I was when I was using, disappeared once you removed the drugs, right? I was a scared little boy trapped inside a young man's body. And for me, like I didn't have the ability to talk to other people. I don't know how to communicate and express how I feel. So one of the things that really helped me and ended up becoming like the biggest therapeutic tool for me and staying clean was I write poetry. You know, I write my thoughts, my feelings, my shame, everything in early recovery when it spills to the surface, 
right? And you have no idea where to put it, what I would do is I would put it on a piece of paper. And now over the years, to get to where I'm at now, a lot of that poetry ended up opening doors of opportunity, gave me a platform, and put me in front of you beautiful people tonight. So I'm gonna share some pieces with you guys and probably ramble a little bit in between if that's all right. Is that okay? And I put you to sleep. Cool. Impatiently waiting until the smoke clears, tight rope walking between insanity and serenity. I wonder if I can find hope here before the rope tears the last thread of my misery. I can't escape the fog, the hands of fear grab hold of me, choking me, exposing the broken me of what I was supposed to be. A wrong turn at the fork in the road, now I can't turn back. Well, the door of opportunity closes, should I make my own path? I knew I shouldn't have sold that. A trip away from this foolish paradise To a place where angels with clipped wings Make guitar strings singing to the afterlife For my soul, the devil wants to know it's the asking price My fall from grace is quicker than slipping on black ice Still searching for solid ground Spiraling, falling down Is it really my calling now? Does it still make my heart pound? Standing on stage, staring out of the crowd But it's nothing but empty seats Do I do it for them or do I do it for me? Do I do it for the pieces or do I do it to be free? Just breathe Cause I wanna take your breath away While well, I welcome y'all to my palace to shame and introduce y'all to my marriage to pain Carrying the shadow that I battled to change And the world was ugly I rose from the ashes of a junkie Used to load up in the bathrooms of donkeys Now I'm getting high off the crowds in front of me Like the applause of fix only fit for a druggie So I take the hit off the people screaming They love me and for that one shining moment these dark skies become sunny. I forget about the nights I was alone. Roaming the streets, no place to go, no place to call home. Raising a broken child of my own, and you wonder why I got stoned. Chemicals numbing my sharp senses. How many nights is a park bench? Is a store with a top wrench, and why I stop betting? The ghosts of my past coming back for vengeance. Syringes saying, use me, and you won't end up back behind barbed wire and fences, but I'm against this. So I pull a piece of paper out and let my pen bleed for you to remember me. Even if my physical presence is deceased, the essence of my being will never leave. Inside these words, please cherish me for my soul to be set free. It's more than just a memory. Is that all right? You guys sleeping? It's cool, you can throw tomatoes and boo, you know, give me the good old hook and pull me on stage. I can take it. Um, I got a couple more, all right? I am more than my mistakes, more than the shame that was once worn on my parents' face, more than my court dates, detox intakes, the living disgrace from jazz institutions of death is my only fate. I lost my faith. When being a son turns into a junkie, when I say my pity part swearing, no one in my family loves me, but they just sick and tired all the times that I manipulated them for money. Lie to them for dope money. This time it's gonna be different. This time I'm gonna change. I don't wanna go to prison. This time I'm gonna do everything that I did. This time I'm gonna listen by listen. So let me get forty dollars and I'll shake the sickness. Then I go hit up a detox and I'll take care of a business. I swear to God, but the Lord is my witness. Just let me get a couple of dollars and I'll be clean the next time I visit. I promise, to be honest, I can tell you what the feeling of lost is. Sell your soul and the devil will reveal what the cost is. It's searching for happiness in the bottom of an empty bottle in the hand of an alcoholic. It's lined up with a straw to sniff. It's dumped out in the cooker trying to suck up all of it. It's losing yourself over the rush. It's destroying every single person you touch. But even when you get drunk or high, it'll never be good enough. The lows are a hole, but you can't stop digging. It was never like this in the beginning. When getting high and drunk felt like you were winning, now you're not even invited for Christmas and Thanksgiving. Create these circumstances for yourself, now you're playing the victim. I've been at the bottom, beaten up and broken down. Crying out for help, but no one was around. Hey, mind you proud of your son now? Somehow I managed to burn every bridge I love down. So fire to my self-destructive ways just so I could burn bright. There I lay in the ashes of a past life, surrounded by worn down needles and shattered glass pipes. You think I want to go back there? You'll never have to ask twice. Tattoos of angels mixed with the ashes of my fallen friends. These scars are like stories written across my skin. Reminding me of where the hell I've been from my darkest days that I never want to go back to again. I stood toe to toe with everything that tried to break me. I started suffocating from the chaos and I couldn't breathe. Another overdose statistic wasn't what I was trying to be. I picked up a pistol and locked in the safety. Then I put a bullet through the throat of my disease just to give myself a shot at recovery. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Can we get loud for, for premiere on Broadway real quick for hosting this event? So when I, um, you know, in 2015, Eddie's gonna talk a little smack about the next piece because he's heard it so many damn times. 
But uh, in 2015, I was given the Recovery Advocate of the Year Award for Massachusetts, which is pretty cool because it's usually given to some politician who doesn't really care about people that are struggling, you know? And uh, I wrote this piece called The Broken System, and it was a vent on uh, in end of 2014, going into 2015, they closed the bridge down, and immediately bust a bunch of people off the island. And we lost 640 substance abuse beds. Now, that was detox, CSS, TSS, pre-release juvenile programs, halfway house, family shelter, the whole gamut of treatment was on this island. And you mix that with fentanyl, and ever since the end of 2014 till now, we've seen nothing but an increase in overdose deaths. It was just reported that this year was, was the most fatal with over 107,000 people died from, from overdoses which is one every five minutes. Imagine that, one every five minutes somebody dies in America. And now all of a sudden Massachusetts cuts off all these treatment beds. And uh, you know, it's very frustrating then when somebody reaches out to you for help and they're like, they wanna do the full gamut and you find them a detox bed and because the system is so overcrowded, they give them a list of shelters and, and say, see you later after five days, good luck. And then they have to start this whole cycle again. So I wrote this piece as like a vent to that. And, um, you know, and Charlie Baker uh, had these like town hall listening parties. And his whole campaign was based off of substance abuse. Not to get political, because I think white and left, red, blue, anybody, I think they're all scumbags. So that's my opinion. They don't do anything for us. Uh, but Charlie Baker ran on, he was gonna attack the opioid epidemic. And the first thing this dude does when he steps foot into office is cut substance abuse funding. Like immediately when he got into office. So I kind of did this piece staring him down and uh, at the state house in front of like 700 people and the whole place went crazy. And fair to say Charlie Baker ain't really a fan of me. So, you know, whatever. But this piece called The Broken System. <laughs> My man. When I got high, it was to escape the pain of hurting. Explaining addiction to a normal person is like a woman with no kids explaining the pain of birth. Let me break it down to you. These four to five days spin washes aren't working. We need to scrap the Massachusetts model of treatment and come up with a better version. Because these suits and ties would rather close their curtains, ignoring the state's overdose rate is continuously surging. These politicians must be living in a fairy tale. And Tom's trying to get into a detox like a dog chasing his own tail. The system is set up for us to fail to the point. Sometimes it's easier to go detox and jail. While the program's up to here, we got no beds. Then when you do get into detox, they load you up with enough meds until the entire unit looks like a night of living dead. A four to five day escape from the day to day. A safe place to stay. But there's no beds in aftercare program, so the decision gets made to hand you a list and send you on your way. Back to the same old saying, like those four days is gonna fix the years of pain, the years of strain, years of sniffing pills to push your poison in your veins. Addiction's like a ball and chain to save whenever it calls your name, weighing you down until it buries you in the grave. And then when you do hit the streets, further treatment is just out of reach. So you keep it out of the air and instead of being clean, recovery's only seen in the better parts of your dreams. Living the nightmare transforming into a fiend. And there's not a soul allowed to hear you scream. But you know what you need. Even though the sickness got a trick up, it seems starts whispering your ear till you start to believe that you've got a grip. You can handle your disease to find anybody dead with an empty IV. Another number, another statistic added to the thousands this year. One thing remains clear as I bury more and more of my peers than most people out there. They don't really care until it's one of their loved ones added to the prayers. A Facebook wall flooded with love. Raise some rays about how we all hate this drug. I think it's getting a little too overcrowded up above. Heaven needs to stop taking my people. The origins of this epidemic are secret. Pharmaceutical companies gave birth to a generation addicted to the need of legal drug dealing doctors influenced by money is pure evil. For the streets of painkillers, then you pull them off the market. They make it easier to transition into heroin when the withdrawals hit the hottest. I don't even think we face the worst part of it. I sit here with a heavy soul, broken hearted, praying for the daily departed and that those that are lost will find their light inside of the darkness. Coming out clean on the other side. I want to spark a rally and cry that might save a few lives. Every day another angel flies while an entire community mourns while saying their goodbyes. All I can do is try to prove to you that it's worth staying alive. I got one more, one more piece of the do. Special request, request from my man Chris. But um, before I get the hook, before I get smashed off stage, I think he's looking at me. Um, 
But what I want to say is that recovery's been one of the like, beyond greatest gifts that I've ever received. I have single, I have custody of my 13-year-old son for a single father in Massachusetts, which is ridiculously difficult. I'm at, yeah, I take that. And I'm not the only one in this room. My man Danny got custody of his kids too, which is a blessing. You know, uh, recovery has given us these gifts. But my 13-year-old son, that I have talks with him about, like, hey. You know, you're going to be presented with this. These are what you do. Like, I get to be involved in his life, and I, I'm not there if I, if I wasn't in recovery. I have a nine, uh, soon-to-be nine-year-old daughter that's the devil, and me reincarnated, and I'm terrified. Women are the worst. <laughs> Little diva. But uh, she's like my Sour Patch kid. She's absolutely amazing. But I have two beautiful kids. I have, like, a, a, a life second and none. I have some of the most amazing friends and, and, and beautiful network. And anybody out there that's struggling, like that's like my biggest suggestion. Is find a group of people that are doing the right thing and surround yourself with them and try to succeed with them. Um, no matter what I'm going through, highs or lows, I, I have the ability to call a ton of different people and be like, yo, bro, I'm struggling right now. And they're going to give me an honest answer, advice, support, or just listen to me back on my nonsense. And I'm beyond blessed for that. I own a few different businesses. Um, I got some fancy title called CEO of Aftermath Addiction Treatment Center that I built uh, about two years ago, which for an uneducated convicted felon is absolutely incredible to be able to, to, to be granted an opportunity like that and to be where I'm at. And I get to try to inspire somebody to live better every day and try to have them turn their life around so like they get to have a positive influence on like their families, they get to be present for their kids, their wives, their husbands, you know. So, like, I wake up every day with a purpose. I got two beautiful kids. I got a beautiful girl, a couple businesses. Like, I live, like, such an amazing life, and I'm so grateful for it. But I got one more piece, and I need everybody's help, and I want to get louder than everybody out there drinking at the bar, sharing on the broom. So can we do that? Every, every time I say I am A, I need this entire room to scream miracle. Can you do that? I am A. Chris is the only one loud in this room. I do that for like middle school, high school. They get loud. I don't hear anybody back there. I am A. I am A. I am A. A beautiful soul, living, breathing, standing on stage, screaming out for joy. Not only was I lucky enough to make it to this beautiful place, so was my little girl and boy. We're given a once in a lifetime chance to stop saying I can't. Or face with any obstacle. Cause they be up and feeling unstoppable. So don't tell me to give up on my dreams and what I'm trying to be is impossible. I'm possible. I destroyed every negative thought of mine. Outside the box, think it reopened my mind. Made it through the darkest nights just to see the sunshine. Just to see the beautiful smile of my sunshine. These are stories I literally bleed across these lines. Even if I die, I still breathe inside these rhymes. And when those miracles are hard to find, face with hard times, screaming up to heaven, please show me a sign. I remind you to leave all of your problems behind that you were designed to be a miracle. I am a. They say you can't be this. You'll never be that. You're never going to escape the shackles of your past. Take everything about you and throw it in the trash to try to break you. Like I put my fist in the glass, smash. Don't ever listen to what they tell you. You can't do it. No, whatever point they're trying to prove. Say to yourself, I will not lose. Then the drive and determination will rise inside you like the fire burning with the heart of a lion and throwing inside too. You are beautiful. Just don't let the negativity ruin you. They couldn't fit into a pair of your shoes. So if you've been staring at the world from a difficult point of view and those gray skies refuse to be blue, close your eyes and say, I am a miracle. I'd rather build people up than break them down because I know what it's like to almost drown. I hit rock bottom and there wasn't a soul around. An angel put their head in my chest and they couldn't hear a sound. And then I rose like a giant phoenix and that heartbeat was found. It's a miracle that I'm standing here right now. I am a miracle. I am a miracle. I am a miracle. Don't you ever forget you're a miracle. Uh, it's been an honor to be up here. Thank you guys. And one last thing, open your wallets and donate. It's going to an incredible cause. And it really helps the youth. It puts them in a position to succeed in life. So, thank you guys. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Greg. We'd like to ask Melissa Barnes if she would come up for a moment, please. Thank 
So we have Eddie Behenna who will be coming up. Uh, Eddie is a treatment advocate and outreach coordinator for Evoke Wellness. His sobriety date is September 5th, 2012. He's a father of two who was born and raised in Somerville until his addiction had him bouncing around to many different areas for the better part of a decade. Through being an active member of the 12-step fellowship, he found passion for helping others and began working in the substance abuse field just about six years ago. He is presently the business development representative of Evoke Wellness. Eddie Behenna, everybody, please. that I've lived in in the city and uh, you know I drove around the last place that I had used and the last place that I ever had to sleep outside when I was homeless and that was down at Potter House Park we used to call it the rocks when we were kids and I slept on the, the benches there my last night at, uh, actively using it uh, and I drove by there and I was just like reminiscing about like how far my life has come since that moment uh, you know truly truly blessed with the life that I live today and, and it's because of I'm um, like super immense in recovery and, and recovery has given me a life like second to none you know, I look around, I see like a lot of faces that like I grew up with. I see Nikki over there, I see Freddie, I see his little brother Dominic, I see Teresa. Me and Teresa were talking about it now. I called Teresa, not knowing it was Teresa, and uh, asking her about setting up a table here. And I introduced myself as Eddie Behanner, I work for Evoke Wellness, and she, you know, she let me ramble on, and uh, she was like, I wasn't going to interrupt you, Eddie, but uh, this is Teresa DiPietro. And I was like, holy crap. Uh, you know, kind of like my mind just kind of like blew up for a little bit, you know, like, you know, I used to sleep, have sleepovers at Teresa's house. Me and Freddie used to run around the, you know, the city playing all, every sport that we could, on every street that we could, on every street corner that we could. And never during those times did I ever think that my life was going to turn out the way it did. Never during SYL, never during Little League or Babe Ruth or Pop Warner did I ever think that I was going to end up being 
a drug addict. Um, like life was so simple back then, you know. And, uh, and, and my life took, you know, a really hard turn at a very young age. At 14 years old, I started using drugs. Maddie touched on it, the oxycontin phase. You know, I watched that play literally wipe away, wipe away a generation. You know, um, I was 16 years old when I, when I buried my first friend to an overdose. And, um, you know, we talk about that stigma that Maddie that touched on, that, like, parents couldn't say that, like, my, my kid's a drug addict because of the way that, like, the family was going to look at him. On the flip side of that, like, I was too embarrassed to go to my, my father and be like, I need help, like, I have a problem. Um, because back then, I grew up in that time where you didn't talk about your feelings. Um, whatever happened in the house stayed in the house. You couldn't let anybody know what was going on, and that's just how I was raised. And, uh, so I carried that for a very, very long time. And my perception of what life was was very warped for a very, very long time. Um, I had no goals, no dreams, no aspirations at all uh, my entire life. I always thought that I, I had these, these plateaus that I would hit in every area of my life. And I carried it. You know, like a uh, like a badge of honor. It's like I, I always thought that like being a laborer in, in a construction company was gonna be the best thing for the rest of my life. Um, I was gonna settle for that. I was always okay with being like just okay. Never wanted more for myself. And uh, that's because my disease had me all wrapped up, thinking that like I was never gonna amount to nothing. I didn't deserve anything. Um, and it was just a lie that my disease was telling me that I believed for a very, very long time. You know, um, you know, watching those names grow up, like, I buried you know so many people to this disease. I mean, we were talking about earlier, like 164 people, I think, from from Sunnyvale alone has, has died from an overdose. Um, and I, I probably knew close to 100 of those people. My cousin's one of them. I buried family to this disease. Um, I watched it rip, rip apart my family at a very young age. You know, um, addiction runs in my family. You know, and it wasn't just. Uh, a substance, right? It was like whether it was gambling, whether it was um, you know nightlife, whatever it was. It was like that, that, that always craving more was like ingrained in me in like a really, really young age. And, uh, you know, when I came into recovery in 2012, like I was completely beaten, you know, beaten down. And uh, I had a daughter. Um, previously that year, my daughter was um, just about to turn one when I checked myself into treatment. And uh, I remember being in that detox, and now uh, like growing up. With that, with that chip on my shoulder and always feeling like I had something to prove to people. I never wanted to listen to anybody. I had it all figured out. I was 31 years old. I, I knew everything. You couldn't tell me anything. But I walked into that detox for the first time in my life. And, and when someone said, like, and it was the same detox I had been to over and over again. Um, I'll never forget the guy. He did my intake every single time. His name was Jim. He looked like the mob man. And, uh... Every time I walked in there, it was a spin dry, and every single time he knew I was going to leave after five days when I got that check. And uh, this time when I went in there, he said, we're doing the same thing we always do, Eddie. And I said, absolutely not, absolutely. Like, send me wherever you need to send me, like, I'm kind of down here right now. Like, truly grateful for that moment um, of, like, clarity and that moment of, like, surrender. Because I don't know where I'd be, with, you know, tell you about that. Um, like I said, sleeping on that park bench, like, that was as low as it got for me. Um, I had got introduced to like a 12-step fellowship in 2010, you know, due to the courts and due to like, you know, wanting to please like my girlfriend at the time and wanting everybody to think that I was doing the right thing. And uh, I got introduced to that, but there was like a seed of recovery had been planted in me in that moment. And I didn't even know it was growing inside me, but I knew that there was a better way of life and I knew there were a lot of people out there that were living good lives and I wanted to know how to do it. So I showed back up to those places and I asked those people, like, how did you get your life you know, on the right course. Like, coming from you know, the, how much I burnt everything to the ground, it was a complete clean slate for me to change my life. And, uh, and I had a lot, and Matt talked about having those people around you that showed me a better way, and showed me how to be a man, right? At 31 years old, I was a, I was a little boy, scared to death, not knowing, like, where, you know, which direction my life was going. And I didn't know how to be a father, I didn't know how to be a friend, I didn't know how to be a brother, I didn't know how to be a son, I didn't know how to be any of that stuff. And, uh, and recovery taught me how to do all of that stuff. You know, like, truly, truly blessed for that. You, you I no longer have to settle. Like, I no longer have to be okay with being okay, right? Like, there's a lot of resources that, that, that stigma, like, in, in my eyes, is no longer there as much as it used to be, right? Because it, 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 we're, you know, we're, we're way on the open as to what we do, right? Like, having events like this, you know, and, uh, and, and showing up for each other when we do the events and, 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 and doing all that stuff. I truly, truly grateful for that, you know. Um, like I said, my, my life was a very, really, very really second to mine. You know, I, I have two kids now. I had, I had a, a son in recovery. Um, 
two different mothers, two different parts of Massachusetts. I'm no longer with either one of them, but I'm readily available to my kids at all times. Right? I have 50-50 with both my kids, and, uh, and that's only because I choose to participate in my recovery. Right? Um, I was completely incapable of being a father when I first got I had no idea what it entailed, and, you know, until I was able to do that. And, uh, my kids know who your dad is, and my kids never, you know, never have to see me lose. And I'm truly grateful for that, you know. Um, I know we're running a little behind. Um, I know there's a couple more people that got to come behind me. So I just want to, again, I want to thank the committee for having anybody here. This is a, it's a, it turned out to be an amazing event, a beautiful turnout. And, uh, and that's all we got. Thank you again. My name is Eddie Bonnet. Thank you, Eddie. All right. Uh, we're going to have John Whalen speak next. Grew up in Somerville, graduated in 84, St. Clements High School, loved sports, married 19 years, three children, and a four-year-old granddaughter. Works for a collection of a collection law firm, Zwicker and Associates, for the past 25 years as a collection manager. Clean and sober since April 2010 in AA, Alcohol and so I've done this thousands of times. I was watching the counter and I knew several names on that list. You know, uh, my heart. Sometimes you want to just give, you know, to people what you have, and it doesn't really work that way. They have to pass it on themselves. You know, you know my sobriety date is April 29th, 2010. That's the day my life changed. Uh, I grew up right here at Trump Field. I uh, lived five minutes up the road in uh, Madrid Square. And, uh, had a good life, good upbringing, good parents, Catholic school. Addiction doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, how good you are at sports, politicians, judges, it doesn't really matter. And the thing about it is, if you're not, people that don't have the disease of alcohol and drug addiction don't really understand. And uh, I believe the first week was talking about the families, right? The families suffer more than the addict because in a lot of cases there's nothing that they can do. You know, the, the drug addict or the alcoholic has to harm themselves. <clears throat> so, you know, I have a pretty long story. I'm not going to tell you my whole story. Uh, they say an AA experience, drink and hope. How did I get there? So, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous uh, at a young age. I was 21 years old, full-blown drug addict. And um, I got sober in a, a rehab center in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And um, at the time, if you would ask me, do you think you're an alcoholic? I would have probably said no. If you would ask me at the time, do you think you have a problem with drugs? I would have said, sure, I smoke too much angel dust, uh, you know, I eat too many pills, you know, because I'm a drug addict. If you put it in front of me, I'm going to do it. If you said, hey, John, try some of this, and I said, what is it? And you said, don't worry, take it, I would take it. So I didn't really know anybody that was in recovery at a, at a young age. I was 21 years old. Um, I had one friend that tried uh, recovery, tried Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, big, strong, tough kid in some of old guy that everybody knew and respected. And, uh, so when I got out of treatment, they suggested a halfway house. I wasn't interested. And uh, I went home to Somerville and uh, I called this friend of mine. He said, hey, listen, I just got out of treatment. They told me to go to AA. And he said, me too. And uh, that right there was the goodness of God because I don't know that I would have got sold. Now, back then, this was 89. Back then, the treatment centers were 35 days. Today, they send you in there for a five day spin dry and then they kick you out. And uh, thank God it was in there 35 days. 
And, uh, and I got so, you know, I did what they told me. I told them to go to AA, or NA, get a sponsor, join a group, do all the stuff that you have to go to, uh, to an alcoholics and honest man. And uh, my life got better. You know, I met a nice girl, I had some kids, I got a good job. You know, all the promises that you hear came true in my life. And, uh, you know, for me, it got a little bit easier to stay sober. But somebody mentioned uh, participating in your own recovery. Right, so I was participating in my own recovery. I was doing exactly what they were telling me to do. So when things are going good, right, it gets a little bit easier. For a monkey one century. Just because we get sober doesn't mean bad things don't still happen, right? People die, kids get sick, they lose a job, divorce, whatever. Just because we get sober don't mean that we live in a bubble. So what happened to me was my mother died really young. She was my best friend. And when she died, I refused. And I was about six or seven years sober at the time. And uh it took me a long time to come back into to recovery. Um, I was I, I was actually in the pub with all my old friends and I was drinking old dudes, right? Non-alcoholic beer. Well, non-alcoholic beer is for non-alcoholics. So after three or four days of drinking non-alcoholic beer, all my old friends were in there and they were drinking shots of tequila and I said, you know what? I'll have one too. And I took that one second drink that night and it went down like I had never stopped drinking. I was like seven years sober at the time. One year later, I was in the house of correction. A second OUI, a possession charge, and off to jail I went. And when I came home, I couldn't stop drinking. The poison was already in me, and uh, it took me 12 years to come back to AA. And by the time I got back, I was a full-fledged heroin. Uh, like this gentleman was talking about. You know, homeless, uh, a wife, kids. And so I lost a six figure job. I'm unemployable. I'm living on, you know, people's couches. I'm living with uh, uh, Jesus' brother Michael. God uh, rest his soul. It's an honor to be here tonight. I just want to say that because, you know, as I'm looking down this, this list and uh, I see, you know, my dear friend Michael's name on there, you know. I, some days I, I wish I could have just gave him what I, what I got for nothing. But this didn't cost me anything. It cost me the pain, the suffering, you know, the losses like they heard. You know, I had all this. Today, so it took me 12 years to get sober. Man. And uh, at the end of my run, I'm a junkie. Uh, I just want to, I, I want to die. I'm looking up the sun and saying, Mom, I'm ready to take me now. And uh, because I knew that if I just died in my sleep, I used to think that if I just died in my sleep, everybody's life would get better. But that's not true. You know, we, we heard that tonight. The families are the ones that suffer. So I ended up down in a detox down in uh, Worcester. I went down to Ed here and, uh, and I got sober. And when I came home, I did exactly what I did the first time I got sober. I went to AA, I got to sports, I joined a group, I participate in my own recovery. I love recovery. I love being sober. My life is unbelievable. I don't know about second to none. I don't even know what that means. I still have problems. You know, I don't, what does second to life mean? Second to none mean? I know, I know that I've been married now. So my sobriety day is uh, April 29, 2010, which April 29th is also my wife's birthday. So every year for the past 12 years, I've been able to hand her another year's uh, medallion. That is, I'll tell you what, you know, I buy her expensive presents and stuff like that, and she doesn't care about any of that. You know what she cares about? She cares that the cops don't show up at my house. You know, I don't have a warrant. I mean, the only time I don't have a warrant is when I'm sober. And uh, I, haven't had, I, don't have, I haven't had any run-ins with the cops in 12 years now. So this girl stayed with me through all of that. I've right? been married now 19 years. I've been sober 12. Do the math. She put up with some hell, hellish years. The last three or four years, strung out on dope, you know, uh, restraining orders. 
you know, all these cops, courts, judges, all that stuff. And not, and now today, not of it. I got this, I have three children, my son's 30, smokes weed, I wish he didn't. Weed's legal, right? Weed's legal. I've been arrested, I don't even know how many times for bags of weed. I have to drive to New Hampshire to buy menthol cigarettes for my, for my wife. However, I could buy a bag of weed legal. That's insane. <laughs> And, that, and now, you know, you watch the news and stuff like that, they want to have, and I hope I don't offend anybody by saying this, but they want to have safe injection centers. Right? How about more treatment centers? How about, how about more than a five-day, because I'll be honest with you, when I was in ad care, I was begging them. After five days, I knew I wasn't ready to go home. I was begging them, please let me stay another few days. You know, today it's all about insurance. What kind of insurance do you have? You know, you can stay a few extra days if you got good insurance. I begged them to stay, uh, I stayed 11 days because when I left there, I didn't want to have to use Suboxone or I didn't want to have to go to the methadone clinic. I wanted to make sure that I was sober. And uh, today I have a good life, I have a good, I have a good job. I'll tell you what, I got this little four-year-old granddaughter who never has to see me used, right? I'm available for this kid. You know what she tells me? She goes, Papa, you are the best Papa in the world. Like, you can't buy that. She goes, I wish you would live next door to us. I go, why, honey? So, so I can see you every day. You know, that's what recovery is. So what do I do every day? I do some simple things. I have faith and trust in, in, in a God of my understanding. So I get up in the morning and I ask God, please God, just show me what you want me to do today. And I go about my day. I have a sponsor. He has a sponsor. I'm, I'm participating in my own recovery right now. I could be over there watching the Bruins. I'm laying on my couch right now watching the Bruins. But I'll tell you what. Recovery is something that I'm really passionate about because I've lost way too many family members and friends. And uh, if you're struggling, you heard some unbelievable speakers tonight, um, you know, talk to somebody. If you're a family member or someone who's struggling, don't leave tonight without talking to somebody. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, what a great night, huh? Great night of speakers and very inspirational. I'd like to uh, ask Karen Canada to come up, please. She's the president of the Clarendon Hill Powers Tenant Association. everybody. Glad that you're all here. Yes, my name is Karen Canada. I'm the president of Clarendon Hill Tenants Association. I am looking forward to helping people. I love helping people. I'm glad I met Teresa because she's like my right hand and I just will do anything that she asks me to do. She don't even have to ask me. She can look at me a certain way and I will do it. So all the other speakers, I'll give you hands up. Yes, I did lose people that OD. I was a, I actually am a for, former wrestler, so I lost a lot of wrestling friends in the in the profession. But you know what? I'm always here to listen to people's problems. I do it at Clarendon Hill, and it's a few tenants that passed away of OD. And it's and if you need help ask for help. Swallow your pride. It doesn't hurt to say, I need help. I'm struggling. I mean, I'm the type of person that people always ask me, why do you always look so mean? Because I'm always thinking. I'm always thinking. People sometimes think I'm a terrorist because I'm always thinking. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a comedian too, so... You know, but I just want every. I'm glad that everybody's here. I'm glad everybody had a good time, and the speakers here. 
that was the speak the poem. I'm actually a poem, a poem, but I, a poet. But nah, I, I wouldn't even compete with him. But I'm just glad that you know everybody is a, a lot of people here, and it's a good you know. I'm glad everybody's here to see what's going on and to have somebody that you got the services and please. Don't hesitate to go to any of the resources and ask for help. If you need help, like they say on the MBTA, if you see something, say something. If you need help, don't be afraid to say, I need help. Nobody's too big, nobody's too, you know, just ask for help. That's all I ask for. Ask for help if you need the help. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. We'd like to um, have Teresa DiPietro and Kim Zafneri. Did I say it right? Zafneri. Zafneri. All right, if we could have them come up, they would like to uh, make a special presentation. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming tonight. The next part of this event is really close to my heart. Um, Somerville Pop Water Organization has been part of my life for over, my oldest son is 40, so he played when he was like nine. Um, my brother Michael, who um, I lost with this horrible disease of substance abuse a year ago in March, played also, and he passed at 55. So he's been in my family for many years. Um, I think a few speakers had shared about how important sports is for a young man growing up. It definitely defines a big part of their future in reference to role modeling, mentoring, peer relationships, conduct. I see my son Freddie grow into an amazing man and he played Papuana all through his mid middle school and up to high school and he started playing football for the high school, but he played up until the 18. And I seen him grow. I was a single parent. I still am a single parent. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity for me to watch amazing mentors during his time playing Pop Warner. So I want to thank Samuel Pop Warner for being an amazing, amazing part of our life. And as they are in other lives, as I see today, I sit on the board of directors. I'm very honored to be able to sit on the board of directors for Pop Warner. And I want to thank Pop Warner and Roger DeRosa for being a great leader for many, many years. And you are in all, a lot of our family's hats, Roger. Can I welcome you up to the stage? So I thought, well first I want to just say thank you to the um, Planning Committee, um, the Community Addiction Awareness Planning Committee because we raised um, a, a good amount of funds that will be um, presenting the check in a moment. But I wanted to make a donation in memory of my brother as well. We all know that this disease does not discriminate and I have to say I don't want to say my age, but at 62 years, I never thought that I would ever get a phone call like the day when I got that phone call from my brother deceased. It was the worst phone call. But in memory of him, I want to um, donate these equipment bags for Pop Water, and my brother's initials are on there as well.
please forgive me for my appearance. I've been through a lot in the last week. Um, my name is Roger DeRosa. I am president of Sunwood Park Warner. Um, I can't even remember how long. I think 15, 16 years. I've been working with Park Warner for over 31 years. Um, I am a Sunwood resident of my whole life. I grew up in the Mystic Projects and like Matt Gannam and these young men have told you, my heart has been open to all these kids along their ride, whether rough or bad. Um, my commitment has always been to try to get these kids off the streets and into the parks into a positive program. We're not trying to teach football and cheerleading. We want to make young men and women that are going to succeed in life and be our next generation. Leaders, team workers, bringing respect to themselves in the community. And this is what our strive is. We have never turned any child away. Everybody is welcome, and they start with us. My hopes and prayers are that when we're done working with these children, they don't have to end up into their programs. But if they have to, we will be there to direct them totally to the guys that we've grown up to trust. So, Teresa, for you and your friends and staff that have put this together to help our kids move along in life, my heart solely belongs to all of you, and I deeply appreciate every one of you coming out. Thank you. I want to introduce, if it wasn't for the Zenudo family, known as our premier, we would not be able to have an event like so. And I know being in the community for many years and putting different events together. Without a vendor, there's no event. So let's give a round of applause for Carmen Tomato. I'd like to welcome Bev. Um, she is the treasurer for Sample Pop Honor, and she is going to accept our fundraiser check. I just want to give you a little bit about the fundraising that we did. It was amazing. It was in three and a half weeks, we raised over $5,000 on calendar sales. So kudos to those, the event complaint planning committee, and the gift cards of donations we got from the individuals in this, in this room. Thank you. I want to present a check for $6,080 to Sarable Pop Water Organization. So before enclosure, I just, I, I want to invite Kim Zachermeyer up here <laughs> to speak a little. Um, you know, I was asked why was I interested in doing an event like this. I'll give you a little background on myself. I've been doing community work for over 25 years in the housing field. I'm now the director of permanent supportive housing for Bay Coast Human Services for several years. And it, it really collaborates with addiction services. Um, and I have to say, the majority of individuals that I house that are chronically homeless are coming out of a really, really, you know, a, a horrible journey of relapse. Um, I see it every day. Um, I work and I help those who suffer with the substance abuse disorder, and it's really close to my heart. I lost my brother in reference to this horrible disease, and I, I promised him I'd be his voice. And this is the first event of an annual event that I would be having to get the message of addiction awareness out. And I'm so thankful for all of you to attend this event. I'm gonna invite Kim up just to say a few words about her relationship with my brother. Hi everyone. First of all, I wanna thank everyone for coming and thank you for letting me speak with a couple words. Michael was my best friend. Um, Michael played Paul Bonner way before I knew him, but he would be honored to know that the funds that we're raising here tonight would go to the kids of some of them. Um, I can tell many stories about Michael, but one thing that really stands out to me is he was so loyal. 
He knew me inside and out. If he was your friend, he had your back no matter what. He seen the good in you, the bad in you, and he stood up for you, even if you were wrong. Um, so I'm honored to be here tonight and to be part of the celebration. I miss him every day, and I know that he's looking down on us very proud that we're all here to celebrate him. Thank you. have Tommy Smith come up and um, he's going to address the raffle winners and I want to thank Tommy Smith to give him a round of applause the MC what a great night huh yes. thank you. what a lot of fun uh, if I could just say one thing about myself if you don't mind uh, this is near and dear to my heart simply because I am in recovery only for a very short time of uh, almost nine months. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I feel touched by everything that everybody said about, you know, every day is a struggle. And I, I have to apologize. I don't remember who said it. I think it was John. He said he woke up every day and said, God, what do you got planned for me today? And uh, every day I, um, I go hiking with a dog. And uh, every day I say three prayers every day and ask for help. So I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be with you. And I'm uh, grateful for all that you do for those who need you. Thank you.